right. It looks like we have a good amount of folks who have come in from the waiting room. So we will go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you who I do not yet know, my name is Rachel Jacobson. I serve as Deputy Director at American Society of Adaptation Professionals. Um, and I'm thrilled to be kicking off our meeting today. Um, you are with the ASAP Policy Practice Group, um, and we are just delighted to have Dr. Joel Schraga with us today um, to share about climate adaptation at the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, next slide. So if this is the first ASAP meeting that you are joining, um, let me share just a little bit about our organization. So we are a professional association and social impact network for adaptation and resilience professionals, practitioners, students, scholars, applied researchers, any title you, you really want to apply to yourself. Um, we have um, about 1,000 individuals and 45 organizations. Um, our members come from all sectors, public, for-profit companies, nonprofits, academia, um, and we've got folks in all regions in the U.S., Canada, as well as a growing membership in the Caribbean. Um, and together with our members and partners, we are advancing the fields of climate change adaptation by learning from Western science, indigenous knowledge, and the lived experience of people addressing climate impacts in their communities. Next slide. Um, and as I mentioned, we are really privileged to have 45 organizational members. Um, it's an incredible group, including federal agencies, cities, um, engineering and planning firms, community organizations. They provide invaluable support to our network, um, advanced adaptation field, and both receive support from the network and give to the network to advance their adaptation and resilience goals. Next slide. Um, at ASAP, we have programs that are designed to build the capacity of our members to do effective adaptation work and work together to strengthen the field. Um, and they include these areas that you see on the slide. Um, we have network support and peer learning, which of course is what we're doing today. Um, we also have a growing technical assistance and capacity building program where we work with communities and organizations on the ground to take adaptation action as well as um, a really strong education and workforce development program um, where we both um, provide professional education um, as well as employer employee matching um, through our jobs and opportunities board. Um, next slide. I am just delighted um, to be kicking off yet another um, ASAP policy practice group meeting. Um, this group is, has been a longstanding um, group in ASAP, um, and we are working together um, to achieve the impacts that you can see on the screen. Um, consistent use of appropriate future-focused climate data and information, an enabling environment for members to implement quality adaptation and a strong market for adaptation jobs, um, a shifting understanding of risk as evidenced by decreased exposure and decreased maladaptation, consistent acknowledgement of historical conditions that have forced people into climate vulnerability and rectification of those conditions, um, and a holistic narrative of climate action that includes mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage. Um, and we're, again, so glad that you've chosen to be with us today as we, you know, continue to take steps towards achieving those impacts. Um, and then, you know, the way that we, the ways that we are um, kind of working together um, to take those steps right now are by lifting up this set of six policy priorities. Um, so establishing standards for climate data and requiring use of future climate information, prioritizing justice and equity in all aspects of climate resilience investment, um, requiring all physical and so social infrastructure decisions to consider future conditions, healing and protecting nature to build climate resilience, investing in the climate resilience workforce, and establishing government-wide coordination and lasting authority um, to enact, act on, and evaluate progress on climate resilience priorities. Um, and of course, these priorities speak to, um, you know, in, in many ways, the current environment that we are in. Um, here in the U.S., um, although these priorities can be applied at any scale of government and in any government, um, we have been showcasing U.S. federal agencies um, over the past several months um, as we think about these priorities and especially um, work towards priority number six um, in establishing government-wide coordination. Um, and so, right before I... Um, turn it over 
to um, one of our policy practice group leaders, Joel Smith, to introduce today's speaker. Um, again, if this is your first ASAP meeting, welcome. Um, there are many ways to connect with ASAP, um, and this is only one of several peer learning opportunities we have. Um, so I hope that um, this will only be one of many opportunities that we have to learn together um, into the near future. Uh, and with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to, as I mentioned, um, one of our policy practice group leaders, um, Joel Smith, who will introduce our speaker. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, I'm Joel Smith uh, from Boulder, Colorado, and it's my honor to introduce Joel Shiraga. But before I do, I just want to uh, say that um, Joel will speak for about half an hour. Please put your questions in the chat. Uh, if that is a problem, uh, when we get around to questions, go ahead and raise your hand. And if we have time, we'll get to you. But we are going to put priority on the questions in the chat. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Joel Schrag, I have to say it's an honor and pleasure to introduce him because he is a longtime colleague and uh, friend. But uh, Joel is the Senior Advisor for Climate Adaptation in the Office of Policy within the Office of the Administrator at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and he's been the lead on adaptation for EPA since January of 2010. And among the things that he is doing is uh, leading EPA's efforts to support states, tribes, territories, local government. And, I'm sorry, can everybody mute their, mute their mics, please? <laughs> uh, so he's leading EPA's efforts to support states, tribes, territories, local governments, and businesses. Uh, also, uh, Quite recently, and importantly, uh, Joel contributed to the development of the Biden administration's National Climate Resilience Framework, which was just released in September. And then two years ago, he led development of EPA's 2021 Climate Adaptation Action Plan. He's currently one of the major focuses of his work is on ensuring that the outcomes of investments made with funds from the uh, Infrastructure and Inflation Reduction Act bills uh, that those funds are resilient to impacts of climate change. In December 2015, uh, Joel was honored with a presidential rank award, the highest honor given to career members of the Federal Senior Executive Service. He's also uh, received an EPA National Honor Award for Outstanding Performance Management earlier this year. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joel, and uh, the uh, floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Joel, for that very kind introduction. And uh, Rachel and Joel, I, I just want to thank both of you for the opportunity to be here today. I've really been looking forward to this. Um, I've been asked to speak about uh, EPA's climate adaptation program, as well as uh, the National Climate Resilience Framework, and, and try to tie the two of them together for you. Uh, but I want to say up front that my, my real hope today, since you're where the action is, you're the ones that really make things happen on the ground, is that what emerges from the conversation that I hope we have are ideas and opportunities you might have for how we at EPA, as well as, well as other federal agencies, agencies can partner with you um, to support your efforts on the ground. Next slide, please. I'd like to start with the National Climate uh, Resilience Framework. As Joel indicated, it was released on September 28th at the White House Summit on Building Climate Resilience uh, Communities. Um, and I will say that what was invigorating at the summit was we did a lot of listening uh, from the federal agencies. and. Uh, I will share with you, for example, in the session I was in, and I'm looking at the notes I took at that session, what emerged for me was, number one, the enthusiasm that all the practitioners who were there at the summit had for what we were articulating in the framework, um, but also the enthusiasm for what's next. And it was clear to us that things have to happen quickly. Uh, and we are already uh, within the administration thinking about uh, how to actually implement the plan in partnership with you. I will also quickly say that what we heard a lot of was enthusiasm for a whole of government approach to working with you all to build the resilience of the nation to the impacts of climate change, to get us out of our individual agency stovepipes and come up with innovative approaches for us to work together. And last but not least, and you'll see this in a second, a real enthusiasm for the all hands on deck concept uh, that was articulated in the framework. Next slide, please. Very simply, for, I suspect all of you are familiar with the framework already, uh, but for those of you who aren't, what we tried to do was lay out a vision 
for a climate resilient nation that relies on partnerships and an alignment of investments and activities across all the partners across the nation, including the federal government. Next slide, please. I will say as one of the authors of the framework, what was exciting to me was that we were able, perhaps for the first time, to really articulate from the federal government an awareness by the US government that we can't do it alone. That you all, for example, have expertise and experience that we don't have on the ground. And an understanding from your positions of what it takes to actually make things happen on the ground, you also, are able to articulate for us some barriers that exist, um, uh, as I think Rachel alluded to, some barriers that might exist to implementing effective adaptation practices and also things that might lead to maladaptation. As you can see, this is a list of the various partners that we identified in the framework, but I had a bold in red climate adaptation professionals because you, again, you were the ones who make things happen on the ground. And I was thrilled when I went to the ASAP website to see this beautiful quote that really highlights how you are on the front lines of all of these efforts in the nation to build resilience of the nation to the impacts of climate change. Next slide, please. Now I wanna to start to transition between the National Climate Resilience Framework and what we're doing at EPA. Uh, you can see here, and I'm not gonna go through all of these, but you can see the six core objectives that we articulated in the National Climate Resilience Framework. And the one thing I wanted to highlight for you is that all of these objectives are already being addressed by activities underway at EPA. And I'm going to, my goal today is to try to highlight for you a lot of the activities that we have underway at EPA and have had underway at EPA for quite some time that align with these six core objectives. Next slide, please. So let me start with what we're all about at EPA. Our vision at EPA in our climate adaptation program is that our objective is to continue to fulfill our mission at EPA as dictated by our statutes to protect human health and the environment in a world in which the climate is changing. And as I like to say to people, our efforts on climate adaptation aren't about dealing with climate change for the sake of dealing with climate change, but rather to ensure that we can continue to protect public health and the environment in this world in which the climate is changing. Now, forgetting climate change for a second, the way we do business at EPA is in partnership with states, tribes, local governments, and others who are critically responsible also for helping us protect human health and the environment. As and I think a lot of you know, we delegate a lot of our th authorities to the states after we set uh, certain standards for air quality, water quality, and other environmental outcomes. But extending it to this overlay of climate change risks that are posed on, on human health and the environment, you are also essential partners to help us increase the resilience of the nation to climate change, while also advancing environmental justice, recognizing that there are particular populations, particular individuals who are disproportionately at risk by the, to, to the impacts of climate change. Next slide. Now, the exciting thing that has happened in this administration, and, and this will probably come as a surprise for a lot of you, is that in EPA's new strategic uh, plan that had to be written at the beginning of the administration. For the first time in EPA's history, we actually have a goal on tackling the climate crisis. And it's goal number one in the report. And that goal has three different objectives. One is to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. One is to work with our international partners to deal with uh, this climate crisis. But the, second, the, the third objective is to focus on accelerating resilience and adaptation to climate change impacts. And ultimately, what we are trying to do is to, is to support the efforts of all of our partners across the nation to increase their ability to deal with the risk of climate change, while again, particularly focusing on advancing environmental justice. Next slide. Now, within the strategic goal, and I'll come back to this at the end, we are 
adamant. We are passionate about measuring performance to evaluating what we're doing well and what's working and why, but also to identify those things that aren't working and why not. And I'll come back to that at the end. This here are the three long-term performance goals, the, the, the goals that we're trying to attain by the end of 2026 in order to meet the, the objectives defined in the agency strategic plan. I'm not gonna go through these. What I wanna highlight for you are those two things that are in red. In the second and third uh, strategic goals, which are focused on tribes, which are focused on non-tribal communities across the nation, our ultimate measure of success is have they taken actions on the ground to adapt to climate change as a result of the types of support that we are providing to them as we listen to them and hear from them, this is what we need by way of support. And I'll come back to that later on. Next slide, please. So again, we are taking a lot of action now not only to build our own capacity within EPA to deal with the risk posed by climate change, but also to support all of you across the nation. Next slide. Now, how have we gone about doing this? Uh, as Joel alluded to, all the way back in 2021, within 100, I believe it was 100 days of the beginning of the administration, we had to produce, along with other federal agencies, an adaptation action plan. And that plan captures a lot of those objectives that I just articulated for you that we, that we have. And the, this is available on the web. And if you haven't looked at it, I urge you to do so. Next slide, please. But perhaps even more importantly, every single one of our, oh, I don't see any colors here. There we go. Every single one of our program offices at EPA, like the air office, the water office, and so on, as well as all 10 of our regional offices were required to develop implementation plans to clearly articulate for practitioners like you the priority actions they are going to take every year in order to attain those long-term goals that we have on climate adaptation. And the, the reason I said perhaps you want to pay even more attention to these is these are really focused on particular regions, and you may want to pick up the regional plan that's relevant for the region in which your community resides. And again, all of these are available on EPA's website. Next, next slide. So now I'm going to dive into the details, and I think this is where the opportunities really exist for us to work together with you all. Big question is, how do we do it in practice? And this is where you will begin to see ties back to the objectives of the National Climate Resilience Framework. In a nutshell, we are committed, committed to building the capacity of our own staff who have to help you, but also you, our partners, through four different mechanisms. The first is by helping to build climate literacy. As we've gone out and we've worked with communities across the nation, we've discovered very quickly, most of the communities out there aren't the New Yorks or the San Francisco's or, or the Chicago's that already have a lot of experience and, and expertise dealing with climate change. Most of those 40,000 communities out there are either middle to, are middle to smaller size communities. And in many cases, because they're dealing with a lot of other issues of concern to them, like feeding the people, putting roofs over their head and providing them with other services, most, many of them aren't even aware of why climate change matters for the things they care about on a day-to-day -day basis. So we've, we're investing heavily and we have been investing heavily in increasing climate literacy through various mechanisms. The second is through financial incentives. Not, not surprisingly, and I bet everybody on this call feels this way, when you go out and you talk to the people on the ground trying to make these things happen and you ask them, What's your number one requirement, your number one need? They say financial resources. And I have to say, and I'm gonna harp on this in a minute, because of the historic Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act, we have levels of financial support for adaptation that we have never had before. At EPA, we have received over, I believe it's four years, four to five years, $60 billion just from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, also referred to as the Bilateral Infrastructure Law. 
and $40 billion from the Inflation Reduction Act. And I'm going to show you how we're using that to support your efforts on adaptation. Finally, we also provide the tools, the data, the information that you tell us you need in order to support your efforts. We're past the days of developing those tools we think you need and throwing them over the transom to you. And finally, because of things we've heard from you, we also, we also provide provide the technical assistance to the recipients of these tools, to the recipients of these financial resources to help them make climate smart investments. Next slide. So let me start with, with climate literacy. We have underway at EPA a major climate literacy initiative to build the literacy of our own staff, again, many of whom deal with things like grants and have never thought about why climate change matters for the projects that they're, they're funding, but also to build the literacy of our partners. Historically, we've done this through the development of actual training modules. And you'll see in a second how we have already developed training modules in partnership with, with public groups to build some foundational knowledge about climate change. But what we've also discovered even within EPA is, you know, just because people have are trained, you know, with a module doesn't mean that when they go back to their desk and their day-to-day -day jobs that their behavior is actually going to change. So we're also launching a community of practice and a peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences so we can actually change those behaviors within the agency and we hope to do the same with our partners across the nation. And finally, um, as some of you may know, uh, the U.S. Global Change Research Program is developing an updated climate literacy guide, which hopefully will be released at the upcoming COP meeting. And we've been supporting development of that and aligning our initiative with that literacy guide. Next slide. Proof is always in the pudding. I just wanted to show you, and these go back to the Obama administration to show you how long we've been working on this. Our Office of Water has developed an, an online training module uh, to help people understand how climate change affects the quality of our water resources. Also, in partnership with our local government advisory committee, which is made up of mayors and county executives and others, we developed a training module that they told us would be helpful to them to understand as they provide services to their communities, the types of things due to climate change that they have to consider and adapt to. So we already have some training modules out there. Next slide. Now let me turn to the even more exciting piece of the puzzle, financial incentives. Thanks to Administrator Michael Regan, in May 2021, when he issued the third EPA policy statement on climate change adaptation, which my colleague Joel Smith uh, helped to develop for the administrator. One of the directives in that policy statement by the administrator was he wanted EPA to once and for all modernize all of its financial assistance programs, grants, loan programs, and different types of uh, assistance programs to encourage to the best that they can climate resilient investments across the nation. Next slide. We've been working really hard on that directive and I'm really excited to say that in February of this year, Deputy Administrator Janet McCabe and Vicki Arroyo, who's our senior climate adaptation official, issued a memorandum to the entire agency about incorporating climate adaptation criteria into all financial assistance uh, agreements. And it reaffirmed the call on the programs across EPA in all 10 regions to integrate climate adaptation into all relevant financial assistance agreements. Now, I don't have time to go into details now. This isn't an e easy thing to do because again, a lot of the grant officials don't even know why climate change matters for the things that they're funding. And even if they do, they're struggling to understand how to integrate language into their different requests for assistance to, that captures the importance of climate adaptation for the recipients of, of the funds. So it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of time to change the culture at EPA. However, we were told by Janet and, and 
and by Vicky that we had to have an immediate focus on the BIL and the IRA to ensure that the outcomes of those investments are resilient to the impacts of climate change. And we've set up a work group to actually make that happen. And I'll share with you just a little anecdote. Uh, I remember saying to Janet McCabe, Janet, we have an opportunity here to incentivize adaptation with the BIL and IRA funds. And she stopped me and she said, Joel, it's not an opportunity. It is an imperative. We're talking about $100 billion just from EPA. Next slide. Again, I won't go into the details here. I just want to show you, we are already making progress. What you see here are examples of $55 billion of investments that are already being made that are also incentivizing anticipation and adapting to climate change impacts. So again, the proof is in the pudding. Funds are already going out the door and we're making sure to the best that we can, given our statutes, that those investments lead to resilient outcomes. Next slide. Now I did wanna highlight for you, and I've already alluded to this, we have been aware, going back to the work that Joel Smith did back, back when the first uh, impacts report came out from EPA that he led the effort on, we've been aware that particularly, particular communities and individuals are particularly vulnerable to climate impacts, not just the traditional environmental justice communities, but others, other populations as well, such as the elderly, those with immunocompromised systems, tribes and indigenous people. So we are aggressively providing direct financial assistance and technical support to promote, to advance efforts on climate justice. We have climate justice grants that are about to be announced through our Indian Environmental General Assistance Program uh, in coordination with the Department of Interior, the, the Bureau of, of Indian Affairs. We are investing in the development of adaptation plans by tribal communities and implementation of those plans and, and so on. And again, we try to do all of this, speaking with one voice in coordination with other federal agencies. Big emphasis on climate justice. Next slide, please. Now let me turn to the provision of tools and technical support. Next slide. Now, one of the wake up calls for us occurred around 2015, 2016. I remember at the time, the federal family was developing a lot of what we call decision support tools, tools that we were throwing on over the transom, making available to communities like yours to help you adapt to climate change. And I was at a climate leadership conference sponsored by EPA in California at the time. Everybody there were folks like yourselves, people who cared, who got it, who care about the risk posed by climate change. And we were parading all these tools. And I'll never forget, and this was transformational for us at EPA, I'll never forget at the end of the session I was in, a county executive standing up and, and he said, hey folks, this is great, but, and as soon as you hear the but, you know, you begin to shiver. He said, and that's the quote at the bottom, we don't need any more stinking tools. What we need is the technical assistance to understand which tools are the right ones for us to use given the issues of concern to us. And then the technical assistance to understand how to actually use the tools. And, and it was a wake up call for us. And, it, and I remember coming back to the agency and talking to Gina McCarthy, the administrator at the time. And I said, Gina, we have a problem. And we went out, we started to talk to communities. And once again, we heard most of us do not yet have the experience or the expertise dealing with climate adaptation. We're aware in many cases of the hundreds of websites out there with information on climate adaptation, but we're overwhelmed. We can't find the information relevant to us where we live and the issues of concern to us. And even if we can find bits and pieces of that, we're not able to call it all together into an integrated, a single package of information that will provide us with a recipe for how to understand and evaluate and prepare for those risks by adapting. Next slide. As a result of that, and I'm, I'm gonna start with the present because we had been hearing that from tribes for a decade at least. I am really excited to say that EPA in partnership with DOE 
is now standing up and funding 17 environmental justice thriving communities technical assistance centers. And it cracks me up every time I have to say this. We call them the, the Tic Tacs. These Tic Tacs, these 17 Tic Tacs are receiving approximately $10 million each, $177 million to help underserved and overburdened communities across the nation identify what funding opportunities are out there, what, and then help them apply for those funds. As you all know, applying for a federal grant involves a lot of time and paperwork. And a lot of these, these communities don't even have one person who, who does that as, as a day-to-day -day job. The Tic Tacs are going to be responsible for working with those communities to help them apply for the funds then manage the funds once they receive them, and then identify the type of technical support that's available out there from federal agencies and others in order to support them as they try to make climate smart investments. So for me, this is just a major transformation to how we're doing business at EPA and in the federal government. Next slide. Also within EPA, we're doing a better job ourselves organizationally in order to build that bridge from science to policy to implementation. To their credit, our Office of Research and Development just this year, I believe it was in April, established a new integrated climate sciences decision and division, excuse me. And its goals are twofold. One is to provide support to our own offices we're trying to implement those climate adaptation implementation plans that I showed you at the beginning. But perhaps even more importantly, their ultimate goal is to provide useful and usable climate information and services through those regional offices to the communities in those regions. And again, and this ties back to the whole of government approach articulated in the National Climate Resilience Framework, we knew right away from day one we're not the only agency out there with these regional centers. We had a meeting with the administrator of NOAA, and we've established a partnership with NOAA's Regional Climate Services Center so we can speak with one voice. And now there's an effort underway within the U.S. Global Change Research Program to try to expand that partnership to other climate hubs like the USDA Climate Hub. Again, because we heard from you. Can you all please speak with one voice? Can you make it easier for us to know who to go to for particular types of information and support? Next slide. Okay, very quickly, flashing back to when I met with Gina McCarthy back around two, 2015, I said that it was transformational for us to hear that we don't need any more stinking tools message. What that led to was the launch of our Climate Adaptation Resource Center in October of 2016. We call it the ARCX system for short. And I will say up front, it's been up and running and being enhanced, and we're about to launch a version two of it uh, nonstop since 2016. The purpose of the ARCX system is to help local government officials in particular deliver the services to their communities, even as the climate is changing. In a nutshell, and I won't go into details about how it works, but upfront, the user, the mayor or the county executive or the head of their environment departments can self-identify using a tailor your search routine in the ARCX system, identifying the region of the country in which their community resides and the particular issues of concern to them. Once they submit, they hit the submit button, they get an integrated package of information tailored specifically to their needs. That leads them by a thread as it were from understanding why climate poses risk to the things that they care about. And then if they're interested, it leads them to adaptation strategies that they can consider implementing. And then it leads them to the heart of the system, to these case studies of how other communities with similar issues of concern have successfully adapted, but it doesn't stop there. It shows them the three or four key steps that they can take to replicate the successes of that community. And it then leads them to the available tools 
as well as technical support and financial support that's out there to help them implement it. it. That's the ArcX system. And as I said, we're working very hard to uh, enhance it now, given feedback that we're getting and to build a new system. Okay, next slide, please. Let me very quickly show you other, other things that we are doing that are cutting edge for EPA to advance climate adaptation. For years, we have spoken about integrating considerations of climate impacts and adaptation into our rulemaking processes. Truth in advertising, nothing happened until this administration. We've just, we have established over the past year, a new resilient rules subgroup within EPA. And this subgroup is tasked with having programs integrate climate adaptation into rulemaking processes, which includes regulations, the NEPA process, as well as permitting processes. Next slide. And again, the proof is in the pudding and I won't go into this, but three of our rules that have already been proposed and are public are examples where we have successfully, in, successfully integrated climate risks into the rulemaking process. And I would encourage you to take a look at these so you can see how we're thinking about doing this. Next slide. Of course, rules are great, but you also have to have enforcement. And our Office of Enforcement and Compliance Assistance, OECA, has just issued a new strategy that directs all EPA enforcement and compliance offices to address climate change when appropriate in every matter within their jurisdiction. For example, when OECA works with the com community to establish a, a um, uh, I'm blanking on the word, forgive me, uh, a consent decree. We now work with the community to build into the actions that they're going to take under the consent decree, considerations of climate risk. And finally, on this slide, I just wanted to highlight for you, we're also looking under direction from the president, how to protect our own workforce, our facilities, and our supply chain against the risk posed by climate change. Next slide. Two more slides and I'll be done, folks. I'm, I'm trying to hit that 30 minute mark. Um, as I said at the outset, we are passionate about learning by doing. We're trying to do things that have never been done before by, by EPA. So we have developed climate adaptation measures, as you saw, to that we keep track of using a new program that that we developed to track our progress. And on a quarterly basis, we report to Deputy Administrator Janet McCabe on how well we're doing. Again, so we can constantly evaluate, see what's working and why, what's not working and why not, and do things even better. This is not a gotcha. This is not trying to lambast somebody who's who somehow has missed a target, but again, to learn by doing, to figure out how we can do things even better. Next slide. I just wanted to highlight for you before I end that we recognize we have some emerging challenges. And as I highlighted for you in those long-term performance goals that I put up, that our ultimate measure of success is, are we through our own actions leading to actual outcomes on the ground in support of you as you try to adapt to a changing climate? trying to assess outcomes is a hard thing to do, especially when you're constrained by the Paperwork Reduction Act on, on how you can go out and do surveys of folks like yourselves. But I just wanna highlight for you that we now have what's known as a generic fast track ICR for customer service. What that means is we can very quickly issue surveys to folks like yourselves to find out from you, how happy are you with the service that we're providing? And just this week, we issued a customer satisfaction survey, which you can find on our adaptation website at EPA, that is asking you, how well is the ARCX system serving your purposes? We want to learn from you as we invest in enhancing the ARCX system to come out with version two. And I will tell you, we see this approach of assessing how well we're doing, working with you, getting your feedback as a model for what we should be doing in all of our adaptation work. 
So if we go to the next slide, I want to end. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember uh, Wayne Gretzky. He was a hockey great. And I love this quote because it's, uh, he said, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. And that for me captures what our adaptation program is about. Not trying to protect public health and, and the environment, assuming the climate is always going to be where it is today, but to anticipate and prepare for where it's going to be in the future. Last slide, I just wanna put up my contact information. Again, I am so hopeful that not just today, that this is just the beginning and that you'll reach out to me and my colleagues um, with any questions you have or any ideas that you have for how we can partner together to better serve your needs. And with that, I'll stop. Joel, I apologize. I think I was three minutes over. All right, we'll take it out of your paycheck. Um, <laughs> So thanks so much, uh, Joel. Um, we've got a lot of questions. And I think, as I recall, we have till about five before the hour when we need to wrap up. Is that right, Eliza? Yeah. yeah or okay. yeah, so if the conversation is is good, um, we can go, you know, a little later. All right, you tell me when to stop. I'll just kind of start firing questions, Joel. I do want to make one observation because I did have the pleasure of working as a special government employee in 20. 21 and 22 with Joel and, and his group. And it's it very impressed, uh, not just with Joel's leadership, but also with the enthusiasm and the creativity seeing across EPA's uh, program offices and regions. It was really something to see. So let's turn to questions now. Now, Shannon Burke, who happens to be a federal fellow, fellow federal employee at FEMA, uh, states, regarding objective two in a national resilience framework, increase resilience of the built, built environment, when does the federal government plan to integrate land use tools like zoning codes as a solution to resilience? And then she goes on to mention, although the framework mentions Norfolk as an example, the emphasis has been on building codes which do not focus on risk-informed development in a spatial sense. What's your opinion on this? Uh, first of all, let me say up front, I absolutely agree, as does everybody I work with at EPA, about the importance of what you're alluding to, building resilience into uh, uh, all standards, uh, all relevant standards, but into building codes. Uh, I will say that um, in the resilience sub IPC, it, it's the group within the federal government that's now, as of last week, leading all the adaptation and resilience work uh, in the administration. Uh, we are exploring the different mechanisms that we have in order to promote the integration of, cons of adaptation and resilience into building codes. The problem is twofold. One is, um, as as I believe it was a colleague from FEMA once pointed out, uh, pointed out to me and others um, at the at a meeting of the National Governors Association. He said it's great to to develop or suggest building codes, but they don't do anybody any good unless the localities and the states take the initiative to actually implement the building codes. And, and one of the things we heard at the summit from somebody from Maryland, the state I live in, and a very progressive state, uh, in my, my opinion, um, one of the things we heard was, it's great to have standards, but you need to understand, even in Maryland, the political process we have to go through to get adoption of the building codes. And I'll leave you with one distressing thing, I heard just the other day that in North Carolina, this is secondhand, so let me say that up front, but I heard from our standards executive at EPA that North Carolina apparently has passed some legislation freezing the development of any new building codes um, hmm. or, or standards. Um, so again, we're trying to explore what we can do to incentivize that, and that's what we're trying to do right now. All right, thanks. Yeah, nobody said this was going to be easy. It's going to be hard. So this next question is from Julia Kim, who is the an ASAP board president and also a program director at the Civic Well Climate Energy um, Group. And her question is, what does the National Climate Resilience Framework mean for on-the-ground practitioners? What emerging opportunities, such as engagement, funding, and otherwise, can we expect to see in 2024? Um. There's a two-part answer to that very quickly. 
Um, one is if you go into the NCRF, the National Climate Resilience Framework, you will see that one of the things that we did for each of the sections, each of those six core sections was identify opportunities. Opportunities for federal agencies to take action, but also opportunities for partnerships. So I would encourage you to take a look at those. Um, in addition, each individual federal agency right now is moving forward as we are at, at EPA to try to identify partnerships with you all. My being here today is, again, one of the things that excites me is trying to convey to you, we want to have partnerships with you. We need to hear from you. What are your needs? Like you alluded to funding. And then I can then connect you, direct you to the available grants from EPA and other federal agencies that we, we have or will soon have that you can apply for, as well as the type of technical assistance, depending upon the community you're in, that we are now providing with applicants uh, for those grants. Um, so let me stop there. Oh, and by the way, so let, let, I, I just ahead. wanted to um, also emphasize one of the things because of this summit and what we heard that we're trying to do is to align all, I shouldn't say all, but as many federal grant programs as we possibly can so that in, in some sense, you don't have to, if you've got a certain need on the ground, you don't have to go to 20 different agencies for grants that you can just see in one place the available funding and hopefully make it easier for you to apply for those grants. That's another thing we're trying to do. I'm sorry, Joel. No, I was going to say, so that's, a, I appreciate that offer. And I think if folks want to find out how they can work with EPA, should they write you? I don't want to fill up your inbox. Should they write you? Absolutely. Or else? Absolutely. Okay. And, and, that. and yeah. please be persistent. You know, we're all very busy at EPA, but my goal here is either to respond to you directly myself or to connect you with the right people to get the information and support that you need. Yeah, and I know you're a hardworking guy, but you, you do respond to emails. Um, Anna Weber from Natural Resources Defense Council asks, on the topic of ensuring that federal investments are resilient to the effects of climate change, can you provide an update on how EPA is implementing the federal flood risk management standard? Yes, great question. We actually have an FFRMS um, uh, plan that is now being implemented across the agency. And the FFRMS is in fact, to varying degrees, truth in advertising, we're trying to change the culture at EPA, is being integrated into all of our processes where, where appropriate, in, including uh, rulemaking processes. So yeah, we're already doing that. And if you contact me directly, I can put you in touch with Art Von Lee on my staff who can provide you examples of where we're doing that and how we're doing it. Great, all right, thanks, Joel. This question is from Honora, who is in Prairieville, Louisiana, a coastal resources scientist and an ecologist and planner. And, and Honora asked, in Louisiana, many of our tribes along the coast are on the front lines of climate change impacts that because they are not federally recognized and do not own their, their historic lands, they are not consulted or coordinated with and are thus unable to fully participate or prevent federal actions affecting their own community resilience needs. Does EPA have any plans to address this? Great question, Nora. And um, again, I'll say up front that we are committing committed to helping federal all federally recognized tribes and indigenous peoples. So uh, our efforts are not limited to federally recognized tribes. Uh, and again, one of the reasons we're supporting the Tic Tacs uh, and to the extent that we are is all of them are there to support tribes, but one of those 17 is focused exclusively on tribes and indigenous people across the United States. And it's our, one of the mechanisms we're trying to use um, in order to support the non-federally recognized tribes. Okay, thanks. So next question is from uh, Brian and Brett, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, it was with the Governor's Office of Policy, Innovation and the Future in Maine. And Brian asked, one of your early slides talked about goals and metrics. I noted most of the metrics focus on processes and offerings. I wonder if there are also metrics looking at outcomes for climate adaptation resilience, something you did emphasize at the end, Joel. That is, how do we know that we are becoming more resilient as we are implementing all these processes? We are working on this in Maine, and it's not an easy question. 
it's a great question and um, would love to work with you on that. Um, uh, it's a hard thing to do, as I said. You know, we, we and I see my colleague, Kat Gonzalez from EPA, who's on my staff, is is on here. Um, Kat is the one who developed the uh, survey for our ARCX system that I told you about earlier. Um, we are, are exploring different approaches for evaluating and assessing outcomes. Uh, and as I said, it, it is so hard to get permission to do very broad surveys that go beyond just these uh, customer satisfaction surveys. Um, so I don't, I don't have an easy answer for you, but uh, I will say, though, you asked about, let me back up, what we're trying to do, obviously, is to evaluate the extent to which our investments and actions are leading to these outcomes. A separate question is, are there efforts underway to develop resilience indices that, that evaluate uh, the extent to which any location and any community uh, is increasing its resilience to climate change? The answer is unequivocally yes. And in fact, I believe it was EDF briefed us just two weeks ago on this incredible, incredible resilience index that they've developed for the United States. So again, Brian, if, if you contact me directly, uh, I can share additional information with you about that. And also, I'd, I'd love to brainstorm with you about how we can work together. Okay, so next question is from Kaylee Chaskin Vickers uh, with Environment Climate Change in Canada and asks, how would you advise engaging workshop members in, into climate adaptation who may agree we are in climate crisis, but who may not believe climate change is part of their role? That if I understand your question correctly, that gets at the awareness issue, trying to increase climate literacy, client, trying to increase people's understanding, awareness of how the climate is changing for, you know, human, uh, because of human actions as well as natural variation, but also helping them understand that these changes matter for the things that they care about on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and as I've said, and again, I, I have to applaud Kat Gonzalez, who's who's online from my staff. Uh, Kat is also leading the climate literacy initiative that I alluded to in my presentation. And early on, if I recall correctly, in one of my conversations with Kat, I said, you know, we 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 don't want to keep preaching to the choir. You know, we want to also reach out to those who are skeptical or don't understand or aren't aware of the ways climate change matters for the th things they care about on a day-to-day -day basis, find ways to engage them and find ways to work with them to increase their awareness. Okay, think, um, and we're coming up at five minutes of the hour. Should it keep going, Eliza, or what, uh, what do you advise? Um, yeah, I think one more question and then pass it to Anna to wrap it up. I know we have so many questions, um, so apologies, but yeah, time for one more. And, and can I say, may I say, um, Joel, if if you pass along to me the questions, I, um, I'll be glad to follow up and send along responses, written responses to you all. Oh, well, I appreciate that, Joel. That's, that's, that's very kind. Okay. So um, our colleague, Shannon Odovardi from Union of Concerned Scientists asks, how is EPA working on its own? or helping the federal government to ensure that the uh, the infrastructure bill and IRA investments aren't maladaptive. Are any of the interagency groups working on this front? Is the consideration of maladaptation, including decision support to tools in the Tic Tac support, ARCX, et cetera? Uh, another great question. And this is one where I will say, I don't know the answer to it. Um, Stephanie Santel, who's on our staff, is leading that um, resilient infrastructure subgroup on climate that I alluded to in the presentation when I talked about how we're trying to integrate climate adaptation into our all of our financial mechanisms. Um, and I will pose that question to Stephanie and get back to you uh, whether or not, I know that they're focusing on a lot of issues like uh, focusing on climate justice uh, in our investments. I do not know the extent to which they're already looking at trying to avoid maladaptation. I will say Art Von Lee on my staff, and I'm intentionally giving you names. Um, these are the people I want to put you in touch with. Uh, Art is already thinking about co-benefits between mitigation investments under the IRA and resilient 
uh, investments under the BIL uh, and looking for opportunities uh, for to yield co-benefits. Also recognizing that in some cases there are going to be trade-offs between adaptation and and mitigation. I suspect that he and others are already thinking about maladaptation, but my honest gut feeling is we do not have a real focused effort yet on trying to avoid malad maladaptation, but I could be wrong. I'll put you in touch with Stephanie Santel. And I'll add the comment, starting with how, to, how do you define it in a precise way so that it actually is applicable. Right. Um, okay, thanks so much. Clearly there's a lot going on at EPA. <laughs> An hour is not enough time to, to cover it all. We can see this has generated a huge amount of questions. And so, uh, Anna, I'm gonna trust that you'll save those questions and we can get them to Joel. And uh, just thanks so much, Joel. This has really been wonderful and uh, really appreciate you taking the time and all the work you put into the presentation answering these questions. Well, that I'll turn it back to Rachel, right? I think I might be coming in here, but Rachel, feel free to jump in as well. Um, Joel and Joel, thank you so much. We have indeed captured the questions and there's also been a robust discussion happening among everybody in the chat, which is great. And thanks for sharing resources with each other as well as um, Joel. Thank you for answering so many of the questions. Um, there have been a couple of questions in the chat about can we share the recording? Can we share the slides? The answer to all those is yes. Um, Eliza will be sending out an email um, once all of that's compiled, and we will be sharing that with everybody. So um, everyone should have access to these resources, and Joel um, felt really strongly about making sure that we all had access to them. And thank you so much for your generosity and encouraging us to reach out to you and your colleagues as well. Um, with that, we'll just wrap up by saying if you want to stay in touch with each other over the court between meetings, feel free to use the policy Slack channel. Um, and there's lots of updates that get shared there. So thanks for everyone who engages um, on that platform. Um, we will be meeting again during our normal meeting time in December. Um, and if anybody uh, is joining us for the first time and wants to join the policy practice group on a longer term basis, we'd love to have you. Um, and you just need to go to the ASAP website or contact, I'm just gonna throw it out there. You can contact Eliza and I'm sure she can help you make that happen as well. Um, but with that, I think we will conclude today's meeting and many thanks again to all the policy practice group leaders, ASAP staff and Joel and Joel for making this all happen um, and have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>